everybody, and welcome to the Localization Fireside Chat. My name is uh, Robin Ayoub. I'm the host of the Localization Fireside Chat. Uh, this young channel has been around for almost a year now. We've got about uh, 200,000 views and about two, uh, 1,200 subscribers, which I thank you very much for subscribing. Thank you for uh, our audience, to our audience for engaging in our content uh, and for also encouraging us to stay online, to keep bringing you good content of discussions uh, with industry experts that add value to our industry in general. Today, I am honored to have with me Melanie Francis. Melanie is the CEO and founder of Global Search RC, that's recruiting and consulting company that is international headhunting company that is focused on the localization industry. Melanie, welcome to the channel. As we say on this channel, everybody's got a story. And there's, of, of everybody that I've interviewed, and I almost almost uh, 60 now, 60, 60 individuals, uh, 60 experts from our industry that I've interviewed, um, <clears throat> everybody I asked them the question, I was able to do some market research on it. And, and the research says there's two categories, one by accident and the other one on purpose. And uh, so welcome to the channel. If you don't mind introducing yourself to the audience, tell us a little bit about yourself and your localization story, which would be very interesting. Thank you, Robin. So first of all, um, great to be um, on your fireside chat. Um, I really highly regard it and really respect the amount of growth that you've achieved in the first year. Localization, completely agree. Um, I talk to new candidates every day. It's one of the first questions we ask, and it's always fascinating finding out. And, and I would say most candidates, unless they've studied localization tend to fall into it a large bulk of what we recruit is sales and they do tend to kind of fall into the industry me personally um kind of unique story when i was relocating back four years ago from chicago to set up my recruitment company uh, out of wales i kind of obviously first of all you kind of reach out to all your connections your network when you're growing a business to you know try and kind of pull in some favors and actually uh, one of my previous bosses when i was working for groupon's main competitor 10 years ago in sales i actually um found her a position with a localization company in wales 10 years ago as a sales manager. And when I reached out to her, she's now the managing director. And I thought, well, great contact. And I didn't know much about it. And I was like, hey, honey, uh, do you have any kind of roles um, that you can kind of maybe kind of give me a shot at? And she was like, sure. How about a VP sales position in the US? And I had tons of experience at recruiting VP sales. And you tend to find in recruitment, it's more if you've sold a service, there are transferable sales skills. So, I mean, I'm a fluent Welsh speaker. So localization really exists in the UK. Um, Welsh language for anyone that's seen Lord of the Rings um, is very similar. It's actually based off Welsh is one of the languages compared to uh, England, English. So I kind of gave it a shot. And I loved it. And then I had all these other candidates and I just thought this is a fascinating industry. And it was actually growing still during COVID, which is amazing. And, you know, I kind of thought, how vast really can this industry be? And even today, four years in, I'm learning more and more and more. We just keep specializing. So it's, it's a huge passion. Absolutely. And you know what? Um, everybody I talk to, they uh, especially like, I don't know if I told you my story, but, you know, for me personally, when I joined the industry, I was coming back from a uh, business trip. I was in the tech industry. I happened to be on a flight going home. Two hours later, I ended up in an industry, got recruited into an industry I didn't know existed 21 years ago. I didn't know there was a localization industry, but the gentleman sitting beside me happened to be a CEO of a company in the industry, convinced me maybe maybe the gin on the plane. I have no idea what it was, <laughs> but I landed on the other side of, of my destination with a job in an industry I did not know uh, existed. And, you know, the rest is history. I love the industry. That's why I stuck around for as many years. And similarly, everybody, you know, develops that passion to the industry. And and this is generally, you know, it's a unique industry in, in general because it's based on connecting demographics. It's based on, based on facilitating communication between groups of people otherwise that won't be able to communicate yeah. if it wasn't for somebody like our industry who's pushing that bridging between 
the demographic, various demographics and various geographical regions. So mm -hmm. that's why that human passion gets ignited in all of us, I'm assuming. And mm -hmm. that's why we continue driving forward in this, in this particular industry. Now, from your perspective, where are we now? I got to ask you this question globally, generally, from where you sit. Where do you see the industry now? Where I see the industry, I think there was, um, you know, with AI, um, you know, a lot of companies last year were kind of wary. Companies were kind of fearing that they'd be put out of business if they weren't having, you know, if they didn't have a unique tech solution. Um, we did see a slowdown of recruiting last year because it was a bit of a wait and see. So something that I did rather than waiting and seeing was attending tons of conferences to really find out, well, where are we at? Um, and really what we found was um, there are still a lot of limitations with AI. Um, so that kind of human element is, is still um, really important um, because, you know, AI right now, um, there's a lot of kind of non-verbal communication, tone of voice, um, you know, the same sentence can mean different things in, in different uh, industries um, and countries. Um, so where I would say we're at is we saw a, a big upturn in Q4 in recruitment because the confidence grew. And I can say that this year, this month particularly, is the busiest we've been since 20 when there was a covid kind of you know boom in terms of recruitment post covid um so it is very encouraging but in terms of uh the types of positions we're seeing a much more variation uh more offshoring um so um in 2022 there was a lot of focus um in recruiting in the US so it was very very competitive lots of sales positions mm -hmm. but now with the emergence of tech automa uh, automation um we're seeing positions like traditional sales positions requiring tech skills so that people can adapt quickly to automation tools um you know ai but then what we're also seeing is um you know for, for want of a better word maybe the B player sales candidates kind of being a bit exposed a little because they're relying a bit too much on the tech, not picking up the phone and picking up the phone is still always the best. That human connection is, is, is really, really important. So Melanie, is it safe to say that most of the uh, activity in recruiting right now is centered around revenue generation? Am I correct by saying that? Yeah, so revenue generation post COVID was really the main focus. So it was a kind of simple mindset of um, for a lot of clients of we need revenue post COVID, so we need sales candidates. Mm -hmm. um, but then last year it was more okay. What we really need to do is start ring fencing clients and you know um, really strengthening our uh, value proposition because things were a lot more competitive in the industry so what we saw a demand in is we actually filled a similar amount of positions last year as we did in 2022 but what we saw was the average salary reduced for us it was by 29 percent um, because of things like offshoring um, you know, budget cuts, but also recruiting more on the operations side to strengthen um, the value offering. Now we're seeing an uptake in uh, sales recruitment um, to really grow because, you know, companies do have more confidence. Now, you've uh, published a report recently, not too long ago, and uh, it was, you know, perusing through the report. It was you, you, you have a lot of good information in there. and. Um, and you've touched on a couple of points in this in, in this dialogue so far. But, you know, going back to the uh, salaries, you know, with inflation is high everywhere in the world now. And you talk about salary reduction. It sounds like it's going in the opposite direction of where the economies, not just Canada, United States, Western and Eastern, everybody in the world is suffering from the same thing. Inflation is high. Cost is going up. But meanwhile, salaries are going down like it just. Is that what you're experiencing? Is there an adjustment going through or no? Yeah. So um, we did see salaries reduce, but there was a slight adjustment in Q4 because there was an uptake, as you know, supply and demand 
where there's an uptake in a demand uh, for you know positions, then you know salaries are going to increase. Um, in terms of um, looking at salaries, what we're finding is um, there are more entry level positions um, being created because companies are looking to reduce salaries. Um, but because of the uh, cost of inflation, rising cost of living, um, salaries is becoming more important mm -hmm. to Gen Z. So the more junior kind of candidates, because they are lower, um, really that's important. Whereas what we're seeing is um, the more kind of uh, established uh, you know, employees, they're looking more for benefits such in stability in companies um, just because of, you know, a lot of layoffs that have happened, you know, in the past year, stability is becoming more important. They have families, health care, even private health care in the UK as well is, is becoming more and more important. And, and you know, you touched a little bit on this one. I'd like to ask you another question on this one, the impact of AI. Um, now, so uh, just a question, just a general question. Are we like in a ground, I don't know if you know the expression here in North America called Groundhog Day. Are we in another oh, yeah. cycle <laughs> of, oh my God, there's a new technology coming in and oh my God, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. And now that wave has gone and we're normalizing this now and we're, we are absorbed it. We're fine with it now. Like we did with Logos in, I don't know, in the nineties and Trados later, you know, any type, any new technology that comes in, the industry is shocked for a bit. Yeah. Then there is that period. It's I call it like a grief. It's almost a grievance period. Right? And then yeah. we, we go over it. We, we're fine. And then we, we tend to learn from it and grow with it. Yeah, I kind of see AI as like the, the tech, the Internet revolution. So it was like, oh, my gosh, the Internet, you know, and you had to get on board on online shopping, you know, post COVID. You know, if you don't, if you're not kind of selling online, then sometimes you are put out of business. So I'm just saying it, it's it's the new thing um, where you kind of need to adapt. But then, you know, once you find your niche um, and don't get too kind of um, confused by all these different AI tools, I, I can talk about, you know, in recruitment. I was head of global talent for a company of 600 employees. It was a British company that um, I helped launch with the board in the UK over in the US. And even in 20, I was talking about AI autumn, and, and really kind of, it, it's quite funny. One of the board directors was like, yeah, well, what do you mean about AI? Because AI just covers a lot of different topics. And really, we were talking about quite simple things. And they existed five years ago, like chatbots. So when you're recruiting, you're kind of, you know, just talking to a chatbot first about what you're looking for. Those tools existed, but I always found the difference between recruiting in the UK versus the US. It, it might sound crazy, but the US were about five years ahead of the UK with all their tools. I haven't, so coming back to the UK, a bit more of a panic, but you know, they're talking about tools that I was using five years ago. I can't of course comment um, too much about the localization industry, but, you know, it's it's more of a panic than really what it is, because recruitment, similarly to the localization industry, is still human centric. So I, I really don't see, you know, it affecting the industry as much from a recruitment point of view where, you know, there's going to be a mass loss of jobs in the future and mass companies put, being put out of business as long as they're innovating and integrating technology and automation right. tools like we have at our company. Yeah, that's right. And and speaking of that, now, have you seen uh, the impact on the skills, the talents? You know, have you seen like a, broadly speaking across the industry and the companies that you deal with any focus on upskilling, retooling the individuals to try to retain them versus you know, no, I got to hire a new person. Like what's the dynamic between retention, upgrading their skills versus attracting new skills? Yeah. So um, I would say the best candidates I have, they're actually enrolling themselves on training um, outside their employment. So, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, 
different things in terms of automation tools. Um, but what I'm seeing, uh, you know, in terms of training, yes, seeing companies train. However, because the tech is quite new, that there's not a huge availability of the training um, required. So it is more learning on the job. What our clients are looking more for is um, tech savvy candidates. So um, we're recruiting at the moment for a production leader uh, based in Latin America and the importance of being kind of tech savvy mm -hmm. and tech curious. So you might not have the answers or the experience, but you're really curious. Um, there is also, I find a bit of a misconception that, you know, seasoned um, candidates might not be as tech savvy as, you know, uh, the Gen Z. Personally, from speaking with uh, candidates, it really is more about your hunger to learn because this is all new tech. So it's fair game to any generation of any experience. So, you know, self, you, you mentioned you know, here, self-initiative is very important. So you're not going to wait around, wait for, as a candidate, wait for somebody to come and teach you this. It's all, it's new to everybody. So, you know, uh, you may as well get to learn it on your own and upgrade your skills. And there's a plenty of ways to do that online. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I was telling somebody the other day, I mean, um, I just developed my first AI app using Ch chat, G chat GTP4. Perfect. And it was just a, you know, self-taught, you know, I just went online and I wanted to create this app that it does uh, create content in the, in the language, but um, meaning that if I want to create like a blog in Spanish, I create it in Spanish, but I'm not a Spanish reader and I don't understand Spanish. So it will convert it back into exact English to tell me what created in Spanish, just to make sure that it's, it's valid. Mm -hmm. And then it puts it through another step of, of revising it just to make sure that we're, we're okay with the tone, et cetera. So yeah. and just, it took me like literally 20 minutes to create. So self-teaching is very important to, yeah. you know, like if there's two types of talents, in my opinion, you correct me if I'm wrong. There's ones that says, oh, this change is too much for me. I'm checking out. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. I'm retiring or I'm moving to another industry. And there's yeah. another talent that says, oh, I'm passionate about this. I want to learn it. I want to move on to the next level of upgrading my skills. A hundred percent. And I What's think- What's your comments? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think really just in general, that hasn't changed really ever in recruitment because when you're looking for a candidate, yes, experience is great, but it's passion to learn, you know, passion for the company, passion to grow, to improve, um, because that's what companies looking to scale are looking for. And that's where the, mm -hmm. the real kind of secret sauce is when recruiting um, looking for those soft skills rather and looking beyond a resume. I actually have a client that doesn't even want to see my resume. <laughs> Would rather kind of go off the basis of conflict. <laughs> and, you know, that, that kind of passion, that will to win, that, you know, they, they, they want to work for your company and grow. And sometimes it's difficult as a business owner to find candidates that are as passionate as you about your business. But if you can find one, amazing. So, so one of the things one of the things you talk about in your uh, report, uh, Melanie, is the blurring, uh, the blurring of the geographical boundaries, and which is very interesting because I was talking to you on another episode, uh, two episodes ago, with a sales expert in the field. He's a sales consultant, Jamie Shanks. It's one of uh, my uh, two episodes before the last one. So, and one of the things that we talk about is the, if you take the sales process and you dissect it into steps, into tasks, and you say, okay, there are some tasks, I need to do them yes. within the geographical region that I in as a business or my customer exists. And there are some other tasks that I pr probably can do them at a lower cost from outside. Yes. Have you run into that? Is this model now being practiced? Well, I started practicing it in my own business when I didn't have too much investment and big budgets. I started looking at recruiting in the UK um, for my kind of second employee and, and, and then kind of like thought, well, let's have a look at the Philippines because actually I was learning from you guys in the localization industry. I was like, wait, so many of my clients have te big teams in the Philippines, India, Latin America. Let's see what this is about. Let's explore. And yes, um, we actually do implement that here. I have a, a great team in 
Costa Rica, India that do all kind of the heavy lifting, the sourcing, um, the admin, the, the organization, which enables myself and, our, and the recruiters to be that point of contact. So um, it's, it's very important, you know, just analyzing the sales process and rather kind of loading up one person in, in a country on a high uh, salary with all the tasks. I tend to say to my recruiters, look at all your tasks. What's a $10 an hour task? What's a 100K salary task? Give me a list of all the $10 an hour tasks. I will find someone else to do that for you so that you can be the best recruiter. So yes, I definitely agree with that. Now, one of the things is we talk about is... Um... Our industry is like formed of many companies. I mean, the latest uh, uh, research, um, uh, CSA research, you know, details it around 19,000 companies uh, our industry has. So, and like any other industry, you've got, you know, 20% of the large companies represents the 80% of the industry and the rest of them is in the middle, small to medium enterprise kind of companies in the middle. So what have been your experience, Melanie, in dealing with, small, medium-sized companies versus large enterprises. And because one of your um, function as a company is consulting, is advising on yep. how to. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your experience between the difference between how do you deal with a smaller size companies to larger size companies? Well, smaller size companies tend to really benefit from utilizing our service. Um, and we do partner with other um, industry lead experts like Christine Gutierrez, who's more kind of on the sales coaching. Um, and what we do is the smaller companies, they kind of come, they haven't got kind of a sales function and they don't really know where to start. And I love that because I'm a, a, you know, a growth kind of entrepreneurial mindset. So what we'll do with them is just kind of say, look, let's stop focusing on the solution at the moment let's look at what the pain is that, that we're trying to solve um let's look at a sales strategy it might be that right now recruiting isn't what you need um maybe it's looking at the strategy are we looking for a leadership position are we looking for a bdr uh, you know based out of say israel are we looking for a sales candidate based out of the usa um you know what verticals are you looking to focus on is it life sciences is it multimedia um but i'm just super passionate at kind of helping them you know make sure at the start because um you know retention is so important but to get the retention right you need to have the right strategy um with the larger companies um yeah you know at board level a lot of the time they've they have the solution maybe they've got their own research team they've got their own internal recruitment team so where we tend to kind of come in is more kind of um, still educating them on what is happening in the wider market because they may have an internal recruitment team, but we're at the events, we're talking with lots of different clients. We've seen success stories, maybe some experiences that we've had to kind of revisit, rework, um, you know, salaries. Um, so every company of, of any size still benefits from consulting services, but it's just kind of, different stages in the process sorry can you hear me i can hear you yes yeah so i don't know what happened here so um doing these things over the uh, over the internet sometimes a bit tricky our audience hopefully appreciate this so we're <laughs> you know ideally we would want to be sitting in the same location doing these things but now we we're doing, doing them online so these things yeah. tend to happen apologies to everybody one of the things i i wanted you know it's always on my mind when we're talking about sales recruiting is the how businesses view and depends on the business, obviously it depends on the individual, but in general, is sales an investment or an expense? What, what's your, how do you read your conversation that you've had over the years with our industry? How do they view it? Is it an expense or is it an investment? That is such a fascinating question. Um, so what I would say is it's an investment if it's the right salesperson because they pay for themselves. Um, but it, it's definitely an investment on the front end. Um, I tend to find that it is the client, it's the employer that is 
in our industry kind of taking a bit more of a risk because the length of the sales cycle, especially say we work with federal government um, LSPs, um, where the sales cycle can take 18 to 24 months to see a return um, on investment. Um, but also what we see is uh, sales, new business sales candidates tend to be the first um, employees that are kind of laid off if companies are looking to cut costs. So again, but it's the sales, but we do see that the good sales candidates are still retained and maybe kind of using a different function, maybe account management. Um, so I'd say good salespeople are always an investment. Oh, great. And, and you know, I 100% agree with you. Uh, you know, if a bad salesperson is an expense, is a good salesperson, is an investment. It goes mm -hmm. without saying to all employees, not just salespeople. Yeah, uh, definitely. But uh, revenue generation is a journey. Uh, unfortunately, it is not a flip of a switch. Uh, all of a sudden, you hire somebody and, you know, next morning you, you wake up with a million dollar in your bank as, an, as a business owner. I wish the world worked that way. Sometimes it does. And you win the lottery, but not always, not always like this. So uh, it's a process and you have to go through the process, in my opinion. So Yeah, I, I actually find so our best Agreed. success stories are um, clients who they don't wait uh, to hire. OK, we need a salesperson. Um, let's hire now, because normally when you're looking, the best candidates aren't available. It's kind of um, finding a great salesperson or maybe a senior leader for any department um is you know it's sometimes i say like um landing a whale account so it takes maybe up to seven touch points the right person might not be there um now but if you i always say and advise um so normally the start of q4 let's talk about your next 12 month hiring plan you know, give us a heads up. And when we're at events, we will kind of always keep you in mind when we're speaking to great candidates. And the best hires have been when our clients weren't looking. And I find a gem, like I did in Brazil, um, uh, you know, a guy, he was just amazing. And I just kind of, you know, with our key clients, I will give them first refusal and say, look, I found a great candidate here. Would you like me to set up an informal um, introduction, just a conversation? It might not be right for now. And within two weeks, he was hired and doing great. Now, let's move the subject a little bit to diversity, equity and inclusion. How does that play a role in what you do, uh, Melanie, on your side? Uh, I'm sure, you know, you are you're satisfying the requirements for your customers. But does that come up and how do you deal with it? Yeah, so we're quite lucky in this industry because it's so international. Naturally, it is really multi multicultural. Um, I think we're also very lucky that we have women in localization um, that really um, kind of has done so much work um, for kind of, uh, you know, pushing that as well. Um, it's great to see that women are, you know, so well represented um, as business owners and, and contributing and generating revenue. Um, you know, yes, it's something that's important with our clients. There are There is still a bit, some work that I see kind of needs to be done um, on certain demographics. But um, overall, I think our industry really has a good focus on DEI. Yeah, because of the nature of our industry, right? Exactly. So it, it's very different to, you know, other industries, I don't know, say engineering, um, something like that, where you really need initiatives in place. I find that in this industry, on the whole, you know, most, um, you know, ethnicities and demographics are um, well represented. Now, one of the things like when in the recruiting industry, that's it's, it's been used for for a while now. Uh, is uh, AI when it comes to, you know, uh, CVs, candidate information, et cetera. And there was a concern that I've read a lot about in the past, and you talk about it in your report, which we'll share with our audience. Uh, we'll put the link in the uh, description of the video in the in the podcast for people to download it. But uh, there was a discussion around unconscious bias when it comes to, you know, sifting through the reams of, uh, you know, the number of 
um, CVs and, you know, presenting, you know, what's viable or what's valid to be shortlisted, et cetera. How do you deal with, um, or do you do, do you have such technology? If not, maybe it's a, uh, which to a lesser effect will become a human endeavor to, you know, somebody submits a resume, Melanie or her staff go through the resume and then, you know, you make a decision. Uh, does this whole AI unconscious bias on your side play a role or no? Um, I would say at a smaller company level, um, not so much. Um, larger, you know, companies, um, they do need to have some sort of automation tool on the front end um, to screen out. But there is um, advice that, that we kind of give to candidates. The most important thing is um, SEO. So to actually see, you know, the data that you're feeding the AI tool is what you're getting kind of filtered, you know, out on. So, you know, the best way really is to look at the job advert, look at the skills that they require and make sure those skills are on your resume, your LinkedIn. There are actually AI apps you can use as a candidate, like a word cloud app that will then kind of scan your resume, scan your LinkedIn, and kind of pull out the, the keywords um, that are coming up. And that's something that can kind of really, I would advise, help help you um, in overcoming that unconscious bias. But that's not something that we need to use here. And well, really, companies are not paying us to use AI tools to find them uh, candidates because that's what they can use. Um, for us, it's that meeting people at events, having conversations and understanding your client and your candidate and its culture fit is, is the number one thing, um, especially smaller companies, um, you know, very, very important. And, you know, candidates um, more and more, more kind of swayed by culture fit, the interview process, the hiring managers, um, could they see themselves working and enjoying that culture? So that's something that is really important, yes. So one of the things we don't talk, thanks for that, Melanie, but one of the things we don't talk about in specific, uh, we talk about it in general, is the language technology sector in our uh, on our podcast. And I'm glad you've included it in your uh, report, which is very important. You've sort of made the distinction between the, I want to call them language services versus language technology sector, which is the the technology provided to the industry to uh, provide the services to the end customer vis-a-vis -vis translation. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a couple of questions on this one. One is, what is, in your opinion, the language technology sector status in the midst of all the AI discussion and the changes of technology? And one of the things I'm noticing is the, um, and you have and you included in your report is the salary grid for um, uh, for the technology sector versus the language sector, and there is a difference. I would say overall, the language sector, technology sector, pays a little bit more mm -hmm. than the uh, the language service sector, according to the grid that you provided. Yeah. A, what is the reason? B, uh, what, are, what do you think the language sector uh, technology sector is futures looking like in the era where we are living right now, where things are changing quite a bit. And, you know, there are a couple of school of thoughts out there. One of them, and that's the reason I'm asking the question. One is would predict in the future that TMS will go away. Some people would say maybe not, maybe yes, but uh, technology is still evolving. We're not there yet. Yeah. Okay. So, um, that is Sorry. quite a big difference. No, you're right. There's, um, and thank you for paying attention to the report. We've had some really, really good feedback. And um, report writing, I wouldn't say is is my top skill as a recruiter, but um, it, it was well worth the, the four months it, it, it took us to to write that. Um, so um, one of the key simple reasons behind the salary for you know, tech positions, or let's say tech sales is what we focus on the report versus uh, service sales, um, is a lot of them are enterprise level clients. So larger clients requiring more experience, um, also more specialist knowledge, SaaS sales in general, um, you know, even outside the language industry does pay more. Um, but it's very competitive. Um, there was actually um, an article um, in the 
New York Times where, you know, they were saying that, you know, AI um, is is really it's such a, a high demand um, that it's it's shot up in terms of um, average salaries. But in our industry, what we're finding, because really it's only been a topic really for the past year, there's a lot of companies not quite big enough to be in a position to be highly recruiting at the moment. So there's still a shortage in our industry of, you know, language technology companies mass recruiting because they're still going through the concept stage, the funding stage. So language services, I'd say about 80 percent of the demand that we have um, for sales um, is still from language services um, companies. Um, There's obviously a lot of um, smaller companies, um, deal sizes, um, you know, project sizes can be a lot smaller. Hence, you know, compensation plans being smaller. Um, But there are some, if you're a specialist kind of business development director, if we've kind of segmented that experience out and you've been kind of selling language services to, say, life sciences for five years and you're a true expert, um, you can earn as much as a language technology salesperson. So it's really being a Good. Which is bring me yeah that's right you're absolutely correct and thanks for thanks for clarifying that because you're absolutely right when when you mentioned the you know the tech sector the tech sale they go they go focus on large enterprises there's large deals involved etc the sales on the services side some of it does some of it don't depends on the customer segment you're assigned to but which brings me to the one of the other items that are very interesting in your report and I encourage everybody to download the report. In, and it's it's been a conversation in this industry for many years, is the commission and bonuses. Yes. And, you know, everybody I talk to, you know, two school of thoughts. One is I don't need to pay commission. And the second school of thought says, no, you have to pay commission. That's typically what drives sales is revenue and, and, and bonuses and, and compensation. You know, a person, a salesperson who does not get paid commission, they're set in their ways. They're not driven. Uh, they do their job nine to five. And they don't need to do the extra effort to move uh, to move the needle fur- further or to move the yardstick a little further down down the road. And you talk a little bit about you know you know that whole you know total compensation in a variable amount versus fixed amount in your uh, in your in your report. Can you highlight a little bit on this one um, just for the for the audience to have a bit of a comprehension as to what constitutes a compensation package for a salesperson? Okay. Well, as someone that's been in either sales or sales recruitment since I was 16, kind of fell into sales timeshare, um, which I really didn't have a clue. Here's a phone, here's a piece of paper, book some people, you know, on a vacation they've won. I would absolutely say commission is an absolute must um, because you be, need to be driven. It's a high pressure um, position. The harder that you work, the more you are remunerated. And that's why really most, a lot of the salespeople get into sales in the first place. Um, And it's directly correlated. Your commission is normally directly correlated to the revenue that you're generating the company. So in essence, you're not, you know, really missing um, that extra commission that you're paying out to your uh, top performers. Um, So in terms of uh, commission and bonuses, um, it's always good to have a mix. So commission tends to be kind of an instant reward. I get that sale. I earn that commission. And that can range. We've kind of gone into a bit more detail from 5% in this industry we have seen one company pay us, you know, 12 percent. But you tend to it's all about looking at return on investment rather than kind of we always advise candidate uh, clients um Don't start looking into the details too much of your commission plan until you find the right candidate. Just know in your mind um, what is the revenue that you want this salesperson to generate in the first year and what can you afford to pay in total. Then find the right salesperson. Maybe, and we do occasionally have sales candidates that say, you know what, I'll take a lower base salary if the commission is higher because they know overall they're going to earn more and they tend to be sometimes the best candidates because it's the right sales mindset. Um, Quarterly bonuses are great um, because 
um, especially in sales positions now, there's a lot of um, other functions that are not directly related to generating revenue that um, candidates need to do. So marketing, maybe small to medium sized companies don't have a dedicated marketing function. So you need to, at the start, mm -hmm. generate, you know, work on the kind of marketing uh, tasks. Um, and then things like end of year bonuses are great because they're correlated to the company's overall revenue achievement. And that's where you really get the buy in of um, your employees. Um, it's also a great retention tool because, you know, your employees aren't going to suddenly leave within kind of the first, say, 11 months because, you know, they have that incentive to stay. Maybe not the right reason to, to want them to stay, you know, just to hang in for the bonus. But we too t tend to see that happen. Absolutely. And, and you know what, for uh, uh, the right person who is in sales and that's, you know, the personnel, the persona of a salesperson is a another topic for another day because, you know, there's a, quite the distinction between somebody who drifted into sales. And yeah. as you mentioned earlier, you started your fell into sale at the age of 16 and obviously you liked it and it became who you are as an individual and same with me i you know i did not study to become a salesperson from a computer science perspective i have a computer science degree so now i got into sales because again i drifted into it back in my telecom day but it's who you are as a dna like it is not you can't change an individual that way you can't take somebody who's an an introvert and all of a sudden you say oh you, i want you to be an extrovert tomorrow and yeah. you know one of the characteristics of a salesperson is being an extrovert so yeah. you, can't, you can't change who you are as an individual. So a lot of these compensations give the distinction that you are hiring the right person with the right characteristics, with the right, with the right uh, specification as an individual to become your salesperson, to represent your organization, you know, and commission that drives them. That's part of their DNA. That's part of who, you, who they are, is that hungry individual that wants to make revenue, that wants to make commission. And that's create success for the organization that they're hiring them. And it also is essential because in a competitive so they're market, calling? yeah, yeah, definitely. And it is so important um, in a competitive market where pretty much everyone's looking for that top performing sales candidate. We find our best candidates typically have about two to three job offers. So you need to remain competitive. And if two are offering commission and one, isn't then i mean you're just not competitive and yeah. also it's it it kind of looks a bit i have to say a bit cheap i mean what how much are you really investing in your sales team if you're not willing to pay commission how much do you value your sales team if you, I, and i've been in that situation where i was well they they put this commission plan together and I blew the sales out of the water one month and they were like, oh, we need to change the commission. But then when the company isn't doing well, then they cut your commission. And as a salesperson, it's just the main reason normally candidates leave if the commission plan is getting cut. So absolutely. And one last topic, and I want to uh, give our operation uh, colleagues in our industry a little bit of a highlight here. Your report also contains uh, operation uh, statistics and data, specifically around salaries related to localization engineers, localization project managers, and testers, etc. So there's a lot of valuable data for both sales and operation in report, which is very valuable. Also, can you talk a little bit about the operational side in the industry and how are you helping uh, the operation team in our industry locate the right talents? Yeah, definitely. So we saw, as I mentioned earlier, a big uptake in recruitment in the operations function last year because companies are really looking to strengthen their value proper, uh, proposition and their offering. So production leaders, um, you know, it, we are seeing a lot of um, focus on finding the right production leader 
Um, and there's a, ro- a lot of investment um, in really finding the right person with the right skill set who's tech savvy. Um, our government specialist clients are looking more at uh, proposal managers, um, capture managers. Um, and we're also seeing an uptake, of course, in solutions architects. Um, but also what we see with operations recruitment, um, not so much with sales, is there's a lot more variation geographically in where, as, as we touched earlier, um, they're looking to recruit out of. So there's a huge, as we know, production hub of talent in Latin America. Um, but also uh, recruiters, um, companies are looking at hiring their own recruiters, um, you know, maybe more for kind of the entry level roles, the high volume roles, translators, desktop publishers. Um, so we're, you know, we just recruited uh, a recruiter for a, a big company um, and that person was based out of Nigeria. That wasn't in the initial brief, but we found a great candidate. Um, so it's exciting to keep seeing our clients evolve um always something new never thought four mm-hmm. years in the the role would be so varied but it just continues evolving and it's great something that was really exciting uh a couple of weeks ago is um really looking um at the importance the growing importance of hr and having internal hr so we've just recruited a chief people officer for an LSP because they're sort of finding and understanding that as they said, and Richard Branson says is it's actually the employees that are more important than the clients because they will take care of your clients. So that's something we're seeing as well. That's right. That's right. So I, um, before I wrap it up and we're coming up to the time here and I, Oh, first I want to say is I really enjoyed this conversation. It's absolutely a pleasure to have you on the, on the chat with me. I know we've had a bit of a technical issue here connecting, but we'll put that behind us. The video editing will come out okay. I don't have any doubt in that. Uh, but I just want to thank you so much for joining me this morning. I hope you come back to another chat because there were so many other topics I want to touch on. And for the constraint of time, I did not have a chance to target them today. But i really like to have another call with you and dig deeper into the uh, recruiting function itself, specifically on the question of, inside the company versus outside the company and the benefits uh, of either model. And I'd love, I'd love to dig into that a little bit because there's a lot of conversations around that happening right now. And But on behalf of the audience, on behalf of myself and the audience, I want to thank you again. Thanks to our audience for listening. But before we, before we get going here, and please don't hang up after we finish the recording, stay on for a minute. Yeah. Um, any last comments? You know, really, it's just great. And, and I kind of encourage a, a anyone. I This time last year, I never thought I'd be on podcasts. Um, I even ended up winding myself up at the Meta office doing a public speaking event in Seattle um, in December. Um, so I encourage anyone, uh, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, um, to get involved, whether you're listening or just kind of being involved because the only way our industry is going to grow is if we really pull in together and learn from each other we're not working in an office anymore where we're bouncing ideas all the time and you know i would like to thank you and a few other um you know people who've really pushed themselves out there and i know this is a passion for you robin as well i know you do a lot of the curating on the weekend so thank you for in- inviting us and-, and continue doing it and i just urge anyone that wants to get out of their comfort zone to get involved so thank you for that and also Let's not kind of forget in person is so important. And I know there's an event coming up in the fall in Montreal. So hopefully we can do something live in person, which is always so much better because the tech can take over. Absolutely. uh, Yeah. I'd love to meet you finally face to face at some point in this world. Um, And uh, yeah, Montreal sounds like it's a great place to meet in the fall. Yeah. Yeah. Well, je parle un peu français. So um, I can maybe kind of practice a bit of French ahead of Montreal. We will work together on that one. No problem. And I will um, teach you thank Welsh. you again. And thanks to our audience. Yes. I'll teach some, you some Welsh. You'll as teach well. me some Welsh. I'll... Excellent. Excellent. Yes. I can't wait. 
Yes. So I want to thank you again, uh, Melanie, and thanks for our audience. I really appreciate you. And uh, at the end of this recording, I want to thank everybody for subscribing, engaging with our content, and um, making sure that you share this content if you feel it's appropriate and you feel it's valuable for somebody. Encourage you to introduce us to another you know, other audience if you haven't done so already. And thanks again for everybody for listening into the podcast or if you're watching us on YouTube. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And Melanie, thank you so much. And thanks for taking part of this conversation. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.